Hello, everyone. I'm Kevin Cruz. Welcome back to the Culture Code Podcast. Our guest today is the Chief People Officer at One Medical, Christine Moorhead. Christine, welcome. And where are you joining from today? Thank you. I am joining from the Bay Area in California, just south of San Francisco, where our company is based out of San Francisco, California. I was, I spent a month in San Jose, you might've heard on a r- earlier show and sort of loved the little crazy place I was in. Are you near San Jose, I assume then? We're, I- I'm actually halfway between San Francisco and San Jose. So okay, right so you know the Santana it. Row. Place. Oh, yes. I was in an apartment for a month above that stuff. I, I'm going to bore the listeners if I do it again, but it's like a retail Disneyland. It was quite crazy. <laughs> it is. It's a lot of fun. Nice place to visit. Wouldn't want to live there forever, though. So uh, that's good. Okay, let's start at the beginning. One Medical, for people who aren't familiar with what you guys do, tell us about it. Sure. One Medical is a human-centered, technology-powered primary care organization, and we provide our care both in person and virtually, and believe that the hybrid nature of our care really leads to better outcomes because our patients can um, speak with their clinicians when they need them most. So either scheduled in an office or we have 24-7 virtual care for them. About how many employees? We have over 4,000 employees. So with um, the type of of company, I assume um, uh, the whole issue about, you know, remote first, hybrid, et cetera. I mean, when you're providing care, you have to be there, right? But what about the quote unquote back office or headquarters people? What's the model right now for? Yeah, the, well, after after COVID, so after 2020, we went um, pretty fully remote. Mm-hmm. So we have um, we have office locations in in a couple of different states that we're in that um, periodically our corporate staff, if you will, mm-hmm. um, come and work out of. We use them for gatherings and for learning sessions, but mostly we have our support team working um, remotely. Great, yeah, so critical, such a hot topic, and I think really um, I like to explore that as we now start to talk uh, more about culture and the. I mean, culture itself, some people think is kind of squishy, but each organization, you know, has a unique culture. How would you describe yours to someone from the outside? Well, you know, we, one of the first things I did, and I've been at One Medical for 10 years. So Mm -hmm. when I first came, the company was much smaller and we started an exercise with really determining what our values would be. And we have, we came up with what we, um, term our DNA. And it's really uh, five five pillars. So one, I would describe it as human-centered and uh, human-centered and team-based as our, our two strongest strands of that, that DNA. And really meaning, you know, we, we design everything we do around the individual. So whether it's in their, our offices, it's all designed around our patients and for us on the people experience side of the house, it's it's designed around our team members. So um, human-centered, team-based, we're a very team-based organization from how we deliver our healthcare. Um, the in-office provider is working hand-in-hand with our virtual providers and, and needing to be very team-based in theory because some... When you think of your primary care physician years back, they sat in an isolated office and nobody saw their patients but them. So we're looking for clinicians that um, really thrive and and understand in a team-based environment, they're able to provide support for their members 24-7 and still have a sustainable work-life balance for the Mm -hmm. clinician because they they are now sharing that experience. So I would say human-centered, team-based. We love to hire people who are intellectually curious, and this could be a whole nother podcast, but I I love recruiting and how we think about who we hire, but we find that the most successful people are those that are always curious and wanting to learn, you know, your your lifelong learners. They exercise unbounded thinking, so that's our way of saying, you know, looking at how people challenge the, challenge the, norm or problems they have day to day? Are they coming up with creative solutions? Um, Can can they think outside the box? And then lastly, driven to excel, you know, we're, we want to be the best primary care 
organization there is out there. So we're looking for those people who want to just be the best in, in what they do. And, and that's what's going to propel the company forward. So um, when I, I think of those DNA strands and we weave those programs into, into every program we have and how we are working with and thinking about the, the talent we have at One Medical, um, but it is a very supportive culture. And when you think of healthcare, you know, I, I think, yes, you, you would imagine that every healthcare organization has human centered at the core, but that's not always the case. And um, so we, we talk about it often. We find it's very grounding to continue to use those words and the verbiage in, in our programs, as I had stated early. And just the more you cultivate and nurture your culture, you know, you, you, you can't control it. You can define it, define it, and then nurture it and um, through, through programs that reinforce that. When, when I hear our team members using these same words back in their everyday conversation, I know they're living and breathing this culture. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great moment when you actually hear people use it mm -hmm. in the language. But let me push you harder on that. So, okay. because, I mean, you're very specific, uh, you know, not all, uh, whether they're clinicians or not, not everybody is driven to be the best, right? That comes with with something. Uh, not everybody, you know, has unbounded thing. Not everyone wants to work on a team. A lot of people want to work, you know, solo or uh, alone. They're not oriented that way. So you have a very unique culture. How are you making sure like the new joiners get it when they, when in their first year, how do you make sure the veterans, uh, maybe people even who are there for 10 years are still <laughs> remembering to, to live it every day. What are some of those programs or initiatives? Yeah. Well, it starts with, actually it starts prior to somebody coming on board. So we think about it in our employee value prop and our branding. In our interviewing process, we are looking for those skill sets. And you're right, they might not all five present um, perfectly because we're also looking for skill-based interviews. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, you you if you get the core of them, if you if three come through really strongly, we weave this conversation into our onboarding. And then probably one of the programs I'm most excited about, um, and I did this at my previous employer as well at Virgin America, we did a study to show really like along the employee life cycle, where, where are the touch points? You can't, you can't be with them all the time and reinforcing it, but where are certain pivotal touch points? And one area we found is like at 90 days, when the employee is coming off the honeymoon phase about day 90, right? They're, the job's getting hard and they're saying, huh, I, I did, did I make the right choice? So that's, we have a program and it's called One Connection. And it's where we bring employees back together and we do this very purposefully across departments. So you have a group of individuals who are, you know, they might be clinicians, they might be from your finance or marketing department. We bring them back about 90 days and we reinduce the culture, the mission and the jobs they're doing. And what we're really trying to do is solidify the connection for them back to the mission, the work they're doing. Now that, you know, 90 days into it, they have a little better understanding of what's required of them. How, how does that work actually um, contribute to our mission? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we have them make that connection and kind of share that back and, and share stories about, so that's, that's connection to the mission and on the culture. We do this little exercise where, you know, they're, they're put in breakout groups and they're just asked to storytell. And I love storytelling. I think it's, mm -hmm. It's how we actually launched our, our DNA back 10 years ago when, when we launched it um, through storytelling. But it's so powerful because they start telling a story with a prompt of tell me about a time you were most proud to work at One Medical. And they come up with a story that undoubtedly has all those strands of the DNA yeah. in it. And they're powerful and they're emotional. As you can imagine, we're, we're talking about healthcare. So it's usually, you know, there's it's very impactful. But we also have people in finance and in, in other roles that if you can tie what they're doing, our billing department, how they've uncoiled this, you know, nasty billing issue yeah. for somebody and the patient just what made such a difference in this patient's mm -hmm. life. So tying everything back to, to the mission and to our, our culture and keeping it strong. And at the end of that program, 
you know, especially as you grow, when we were smaller, we'd bring all of these people into one room and I would be there and I'd, I'd lead this conversation. Well, with 4,000, it's getting more difficult. We do it remotely now, but at the end of that, this is the last thing I want to leave them with is hopefully, you know, we, you, we've done a good job in explaining what our culture is and that's what attracted you to come work for us. And now with the rapid growth we're going to have ahead of us, you have to carry this. Mm. You carry the culture with you. Protect it. When you see people behaving in a way that is not um, conducive to our culture, and usually that's around the human-centered part, um, say something. You know, mm -hmm. the TSA, say something, do something. Go ahead and 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 say something because you are you're you're in control of this. You are protecting the the culture as we go forward. So I I leave them with that. And then in all of our other learning programs, we have a full learning journey for um, people who are are with us. A lot of it is around management, um, but we you know we bring it up and we we try to bring that back and thread that through all of our programs. Christine, so much good stuff right there in your <laughs> first um, answer. And I, as I'm doing more and more of these interviews, I, I'm now purposely thinking in my head, like I'm listening for the stealable ideas, right? And, and, and you already are giving so many stealable ideas. The best stealable ideas are the ones that don't necessarily cost a lot of money. It, it mm -hmm. might just require different thinking. And so just the fact that you're doing sort of a 90 day, you know, so someone joins and at the 90 day mark, there's almost uh, maybe even a booster shot or something, you know, around, <laughs> around, uh, around culture, because let's face it, the, the boot camp new hire orientation that so many companies do, a lot of it's about, it's the paperwork, it's yeah. the process, it's the, you know, where, where's, where's this, who's that? And you're not really in the zone to focus or to feel that mission, vision, values. And so just this idea of like, hey, let's let's do it on a 90 day mark. I've done a lot of work in employee engagement and I can't remember who said it once to me, but I thought it was smart. He says, you know, on everybody's first day at work, they don't show up disengaged. They're not answering your survey 3.2 on a five point scale. <laughs> they start at a five and then something happens. <laughs> so this idea of like, you've got them early, but now they're kind of in it and it's like, okay, let's make sure they don't have buyer's remorse. They realize like, okay, here's the reality and I'm still a little overwhelmed. Now let's get back to the mission. And you know, the storytelling is another powerful thing. People will fight to protect the thing they help build. And if they're talking about their stories themselves, they're building it, they're shaping it. So, so much good stuff right, right there. Um, let me ask, I think, you know, I'm passionate about leadership development because the bosses control about 70% of how we feel about work, you know, the Gallup, Gallup research. And so you've got 4,000 employees. You probably have, I'm guessing, I don't know, 600 frontline managers, give or take. Um, what are you doing to make sure that your, your frontline managers are trained and carrying the culture the right way and leading in the right way? Well, one of, thank you. Thank you for asking that question. Because one of the things we're most proud of, um, you know, and and I, I don't even know that this is canned. I think this is a byproduct of all of the things that we are doing. But in our last, last several engagement surveys, we are scoring 89% on the question, my manager genuinely cares about my well-being. And that's not something you can train to teach to, but I think it's the culmination of how we are preparing our leaders that that's a, a wonderful byproduct, something you know we're we're very proud of. We have, as far as programs go, we start before somebody become we have a program that is um, called Emerging Leaders Program. And this is before they become a manager. So this is that transitional period because, all too often, we somebody raises their hand, they get tapped on the shoulder to, to lead people. And somewhere thereafter, you begin their kind of their formal training, right? We've realized, let's go upstream from that and talk about emerging leaders and how do we get people to start thinking in a different way 
um, working on some skill sets that they're going to need to become a good leader before they actually manage anybody. Mm -hmm. And part of this program, we have a waiting list actually to, to get into the program. And the person needs to raise their hand and say, I'm interested in a leadership role, but they also have to that goes hand in hand with their performance and being recommended by their leader to get into the program. And in that program, we're, you know, doing things such as there's a communication piece in there. How, how do you communicate? And part of that is introducing them to the concept of real-time feedback. Mm. How do we give real-time feedback and have those difficult conversations and have them in a way that in a human centered way, using our language again, so that um, people can hear the feedback without feeling attacked. Right. And there's a, definitely an, an art to that as, as I know that you are very well aware of. But so we start with that program, then we have different leadership programs, uh, you know, the um, new leader orientation, as somebody becomes a new leader, then it's, it's the next step in that evolution leader essentials. And then finally, our lead at um, OM at One Medical is for our, we that's the last program that we just built out. We've had our first cohort go through it with several of our vice presidents hmm. and our executive team is going through it consecutively at the same time where we're getting 360 feedback and um, we'll be working on some leadership principles um, along the way. But part of that has to be not just the leadership principles, but like how you show up every day. And I, and I think that's what our DNA speaks to and our, our, our values speak to how you show up. It's not just, um, you know, what you say, it's really how you behave that people are looking at. And that's going to, you know, you can say one thing and if you behave in a different way, you know, it, you lose all your credibility. Yeah, you started uh, by talking about you know eighty nine percent on the survey about you know my manager cares about me. Um, Lead X research employee experience caring is now a top five driver of employee engagement. And as I'm you know uh, fifty six years old and I think about my own leadership career, I mean I make mistakes like crazy. Like I mean I write about this stuff, I teach stuff, and I make mistakes as a leader all the time but I don't think anyone has ever doubted that I care about them, like on my team. And when, mm. when they know you care, you can get a lot of stuff wrong. <laughs> you make all kinds of mistakes and yet they're forgiving. You know, there, there's, there's grace there. So it's, it's incredible that you started with that, uh, that particular trait because it's kind of hard to teach and it does come from the values um, and the culture. And again, you know, in terms of stealable ideas, I love it that you, you're starting with that emerging leader program. I think it was um, Zenger Folkman research that said the average age of the first time managers age 30, the average age of when people get management training is 35. Yeah. <laughs> like this, what? Why? We entrust them with the lives and minds of all these people for five years before we actually tell them how to do it or, you know, best practices, I should say. Um, and so the fact that you're actually engaging your probably high potential, you know, of uh, individual contributors in a way that's getting them ready and developed so that then they're, you know, um, receptive and hitting the ground running. Also with your new leader essentials, it's great that you're starting early. Everybody should be doing that really should. Yeah. Well, Kevin, I, I also hear in your example, a lot of candor. And I think that, you know, vulnerability and sharing, I try to do the same with my team. I've made many mistakes. There'll be more mistakes I make <laughs> and kind of being vulnerable about it and yeah. sharing that that's, it's okay to do that, I think is um, demonstrating something that's very important for leaders to emulate because yeah. we are going to make mistakes and it's, it's okay. And you're right. If they have trust and feel you care for them, they are very forgiving. You, you mentioned the, the survey. So are you doing, did, did I hear you say you're doing the employee voice survey multiple times a year? Is that right? We do it twice a year. Twice so a we year. do the full survey in the spring and yep. then we do a short and more pulse-like in the fall. Other ways you are gathering feedback about your culture? Yeah, we, well, we are also kind of a lean organization where we have stand-up huddles every day and we, we have them in the clinical offices and we have over 200 of those offices and you go in, there's a huddle board with all of their metrics. They're huddling every day talking about it, but we always leave space for escalations. Mm -hmm. And that is typically the things that 
um, are not going right or something that's happened that, um, you know, somebody might need some help in how do you solve. I've been in our clinical, because the other thing we do is we also go to rounds once a month as all leaders. We, hmm. We're really highly encouraged to be out in the field. And these are in our medical offices and, and observing and, and giving feedback, but also being there to support the teams that are doing the lion's work. Um, so one of the things there, though, is I, w- I witnessed was clinicians together and one clinician when it got to an escalation portion, which sharing a difficult conversation that they needed that they had had with a patient mm. and um, to watch the other providers give support. And in some cases, some advice, well, here's here's how I handled a situation very similar to that. That kind of peer to peer support is um, just just crucial in in that team based environment. Yeah, that's so great. we get a lot of real time feedback daily because we have those huddles. Um, probably that is even even virtually with our remote team. I huddle with my team every every morning, and uh, that is where I am getting the pulse of what's going on in the organization. It, it usually will come up as an escalation. Yeah, it's great. Um, you've already talked about a lot of a lot, many many programs, a lot of great programs. Is there any other things you'd want to share that you're particularly proud of or has gotten great results for you? Yeah, well, about five years ago with the um, our new CEO who came in there, Amir Dan Rubin, he brought with him C, uh, a CI, CI care philosophy. And that is something we practice. And it is really, it's a way to help people remember what great customer service looks like you know, when it stands for um, connect, introduce, communicate, ask, respond, and exit. And after you, this becomes incorporated in your practice, it's just what you do Mm. all the time. And when you think about it, it's so missing in a lot of clinical settings where actually, you know, because the problem is most clinicians have so little time with their patients. So there's not a lot of time to connect or introduce themselves, ask permission, I'm going to do this, is this okay? That Mm -hmm. rarely happens, right? But it's so powerful because it puts the onus back to the the patient to give that permission. And it just establishes a very different relationship. And we take that, the the CI care moniker through um, our interactions with corporate staff, Mm-hmm. Um, so, so if we begin a meeting and there's somebody new on a zoom that we don't know, we all stop and introduce ourselves to that person. You know, it takes a little bit of time, but it just sets the tone in a very respectful nature of how we expect the conversation to go. Yeah, that's great. That's, that's great. I, this is a short format podcast. We don't have a lot of time. So I want to move on to some faster, maybe a little more fun, uh, questions, uh, starting with, you know, imagine that you could send any book or podcast, or maybe it's a Netflix, Netflix series. I don't know, you know, any piece of media to everyone in the organization, 4,000 copies. And they promise everyone's going to read it, at least listen to it or whatever. What are you going to send everyone? This was supposed to be the fun part. You asked me the <laughs> this most is the difficult. hard question. <laughs> the, the fun part, easy for me is culture. This is so difficult because as we were sharing prior <laughs> to being recorded, there's so many good nuggets out there. Yeah. I guess if I had to pick one, it may be it would be Brene Brown's A Dare to Lead. I love the vulnerability piece of it and the radical candor. And I think if people were just very honest and direct, we could cut so much of the spin that happens yeah. out and people saying, well, do you think what they really meant? Have you ever left a meeting? And then you see people huddling, trying to figure out what, what that leader actually <laughs> meant. And I think, oh my gosh, what a waste of time. Let's, let's just be really direct and, and concise in what we're saying and, and trust the audience to, to have a direct message. Yeah. So I think I- that's what it would be. I think Brene Brown's work is, is great. I, um, I've i shared on, on this podcast that Daring Greatly, I was four, 40 years old and had just sold a previous company. And um, her book hit me like a ton of bricks. It's like all of a sudden <laughs> she starts talking about, you know, self-worth, needs for, need for external validation or something. I'm like, 
oh, so that's why I am the way I am. It like <laughs> really held up a mirror and it's like, okay, I'm going to do some things differently now. So I recommend that book um, uh, to a lot of people. And it was actually a former uh, team member that had recommended it to me. It, it definitely um, changed my life. So let's let's think about um, you, you've been you've been at One Medical for a long time. You've had a distinguished career. You know, what's something that you know now that you maybe wish you knew on day one of becoming a chief people officer? Like, I don't know if you guys are on Slack or Teams, but if you could send a message to the younger version of yourself with a little piece of advice, what would you say? Well, I would say my advice to anybody going into the HR world is the it's a wonderful opportunity to be an HR, first of all, right now. Secondarily, don't just focus on HR work, really to get to the pinnacle and assuming you want to reach that C level, that's an assumption I'm making. But if you do, learn, learn as much as you can about business because it is really turned into a, a strategic role. If in the best scenarios, you will find yourself as an advisor to the CEO because every aspect of business has a people component to it, right? Yeah. So to be the best advisor you can be, you have to understand um, business. So steep yourself in, um, you know, a lot of folks I know who go into HR, they go in because they're very empathetic. Mm -hmm. They're they're good with people and, and somehow they've gotten advice to steer their career that way. But I would say, jump into business acumen, understand, you know, understand the balance sheets and, and what businesses need to do to be profitable, understand business strategy. And then coupled with undoubtedly the HR background, you can, you know, develop into that really strategic partner, which it's wonderful to see. This was, I have been doing this work long enough that I first started out in personnel then moved into HR and now I am in the people experience team. But that is in a way, it's an evolution of how the, yeah. the role has come and, and how far it's come. I would say, I feel I have a strongest seat at the table as any of my peers on, on the C-suite. And that's the way it should be in most organizations. Yeah, that's fantastic. We, we were talking about this a little bit before we hit the record button about it's I, I think it's the most challenging time to be a chief people officer and also the best time just because, again, you know, the work, the great work that you're doing is now touching every part of the organization. It's so critical and everyone's finally realizing how critical uh, it is. Um, we're talking, Christine, it's November. We just hit in, we've crossed into November here. The year's almost over. What are you and your team going to focus on when it comes to people stuff uh, for next year? Uh, well, we have an interesting year coming ahead of us. This year, we were um, we were acquired by Amazon. So mm -hmm. I don't know if we've chatted about that, but um, you know, the first and, and respectfully so, Amazon really has been a bit hands off and just wanting to learn what we do because they acquired us for a reason, and and I have a lot of respect for them uh, approaching it that way. As we go into next year, we're going to be looking to leverage what is best within both organizations and see how we can, um, actually, there's so many ways they can help us with our growth. And that's what we're looking forward to. How do we really leverage what they know how to do best? And that's outreach to, to customers. So we think they're going to be very beneficial that way. They have a tremendous tech team mm -hmm. behind them. We have our own proprietary technology. So we expect that um, they're going to be able to help us quite a bit move, move that at a, a faster clip. So my team is going to be looking for, you know, how do we integrate, where do we integrate and um, hopefully bring the best of both companies together. I, I'm excited and I don't, uh, you know, we're, we're here to talk about um, mainly culture. So I don't want to go too deep into this, but I'm glad you brought up the Amazon um, piece because I'm so excited for you. Uh, I think that, you know, from not uh, uh, an employee, um, you know, I can just say like, I clearly you're successful without Amazon, but the potential, whether it's ever realized or not, we'll find out together. It's a tricky business, tricky industry that you're in. But 
Amazon, I mean, with their reach already, you know, people are getting invitations for one medical and I think in um, parts of the country and just access to people that you wouldn't have had. I mean, Amazon's Amazon, right? They're yeah. at my door every day. <laughs> and so the um, where, where I am just outside of Philadelphia, demographically, it it's, would look like a, you know, a, a well-off area, and yet the healthcare system is abysmal. And there isn't an integrated system that there is in other parts of the country. And so I think um, the potential for one medical to leverage some of what Amazon brings could be like so helpful to literally millions of people, millions of lives. My fingers are crossed, you know, to see uh, all the good stuff that's going to come out of it. So I'm glad you were able to share that. And it's an, quite an exciting time, right? It is, it is. And things are, are moving fast there. You know, when you think about the companies that could have acquired us, I think we, we found the, we were lucky and and found the the right partner because they do believe in growth and and they are very customer obsessed and that's a term they use often the same way we are very human centered and focused on our patients so i think the marriage of those two will will mean really good things and and yes that chapter is not yet written in that book yeah. <laughs> but well, we look forward to it it's exciting to uh, to write that chapter Christine Moorhead, Chief People Officer at One Medical. Thanks for spending some time with us today. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you for shining the light on these very important topics too. Thanks. Appreciate it.